In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. podcast of Vundablog.com, the home of whatever. I am your host, Stephen. With me today, as always, is my cohortress, the Chicken Nugget, Danny. Also with us is our other co-host, the They of These, our podcast champion of the world, non-binary champion, D-Rock in the house. And this is a super duper special episode uh on a lesser podcast they call this an extravaganza but this is just the first podcast we've done for 2023 so we're starting off strong and we have the pleasure of having the cast of adult swim yule log available on hbo max here today um let me go through the crew first off we have Sky Passmore, Sky dot Passmore on Instagram. Um, they play Henry in Adult Swim Yule Log. They were also on the campaign and the Radcliffs, and they have uh, a movie you can watch the entire thing right now on YouTube called Glitch that looks super cool. Um, they're also a uh, Shakespearean actor. And uh, we're super proud to have Sky Passmore here. Hello. How you doing, Sky? I'm good. Thanks for having me. How does it feel being a part of uh, like epic stoners in movie history? <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's my dream. I've always wanted to play a stoner, so uh, really? now I can move on and find the next thing. Now you can do lesser things like like Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Also with us today, we have Sean Hankinson, who uh, his Instagram is a very smart Sean Hankinson. Um, they also run actor footage um, where they help out other actors and give awesome tips on, um, on being in the industry and provide, uh, I believe, superior quality um, demo reels for actors for a moderate price. Um, they are also in an episode of The Watcher. That's the Netflix one, right? Yeah. Right now on Netflix, very hot. The Watcher. Um, my, I, the the one of the things I got most excited that Sean Hankins is in is he's on Digimon Fusion Battles, <laughs> Voice of Penny. So that's super dope. Um, they also have a film that's fully available on YouTube right now called Camp Wedding, that is a, a slasher movie that looks just so adorable. Um, how you doing, Sean? Pretty fantastic. How are you guys? We're doing great. How's it feel um, getting uh, your head smashed in? <laughs> it's pretty epic. Are you kidding me? And now I'm like forever in the horror genre is like a really really cool death so i'm very honored one of the coolest yeah definitely <laughs> next up we have tordy clark um a kiwi actor who um has some great stuff on uh their tiktok uh which is also uh tordy clark and on their instagram they are in uh not just adult swim yule log but the amazing uh, 2022 film uh, Glorious that uh, made some of our top 10 lists um, for 2022 horror. Um, they're also in Bad Candy. So if you want to do like a 
a Tordy Clark triple feature, Bad Candy, Glorious, and Adulta Mule Log would be a great triple feature. How you doing, Tordy? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, awesome seeing all you guys get on this and you've created your own uh, what, Twitter channel and Instagram channel and yeah, we're gonna be social but media podcast all over the place. Yeah, right? it's wonderful. So thank I'm very you. happy to be here. Great company to be here with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how does it feel getting to now be on a list of great horror movie mothers? <laughs> yes. I could corner that market. <laughs> um, it feels great. I mean, it's been some uh, completely insane, wild, fantastic uh, reviews. And what I love is just the fans are crazy, no offense, but you guys are crazy fans. And I love that. So it's just like this built-in bucket of crazy fans who are so supportive. So it feels wonderful. It feels wonderful to be uh, you know, watched regardless because the fans are going to watch. It's a crazy genre for fans. Again, no yeah. offense. No, no. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and, it is it's, it's, but it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Horror fans are a very passionate group of people. Very. And I love that. I'm, I'm just, that's, everybody wants that kind of spiritual, like, place to go. And that's your fan, that's your religion, I guess. It's wonderful. So that it feels great. It feels great. And it's, it was so much fun being part of this whole project and really great, great, great players to be with, you know, I could, it's a great team, a wonderful team, the best. Absolutely. Next up on my intros, I have Justin Miles, AKA Justin Kilometers on Instagram, who plays <laughs> Alex in Adult Swim Yule Log. Uh, you may also remember Alex as uh, the writer Zeb on uh, the last episode of She-Hulk Attorney at Law. He officially works for uh, Kevin in the Marvel Universe. Um, he's also been on NCIS New Orleans with uh, one of my faves, Scott Bakula. So shout out to Scott Bakula right now. Shout out to Scott Bakula. I love that uh, dude. He was also on uh, Swamp Thing for the nerds out there and The Walking Dead. And I think my favorite thing that I recognize you from was from Eastbound and Down. You got your head humped by Jason Sudeikis. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel getting, getting um, a, a famous movie head hump? Uh, yeah, that was a, a, a career highlight for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was, that, that was a cool show to be on because I was a, such a huge fan of that show before I even auditioned for it. So that was that was neat. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I saw that you've worked a lot um, with. Um, oh, no. What is the one name that I didn't write down? I'm putting off memory. Um, uh, Paulson, the guy who plays the, the deputy that you did a lot of uh, short films and uh, he's all. Oh, over Jonathan. Here. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, that's my best. That's my best friend. We make stuff together. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I actually created like um, a playlist of like a bunch of stuff on YouTube that I found of you guys that I'm going to put out um, with um, the podcast in case anyone's interested in uh, in your other projects or other things on your resume uh, to check out. Cool. Um, and next up is uh, the greatest podcast producer the Bundacast has ever had, <laughs> Elia. Thank you so much for helping put this together. Daniela plays Holly in Adult Swim Yule Log. Um, she was also in uh, Power Book Three: Raising Canaan. Um, she was on an episode of Nine One One. She. Um, what caught my attention was uh, the a film on YouTube she has right now made by Cody Clark called uh, Ramekin. Um, that's another kind of horror movie, it looks like. And uh, she's also done some uh, behind the scenes work on a Star Wars short called uh, Star Wars, An Idiot's Array and uh, The Overpass. How you doing, Daniela? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> 
Thank you so, so much. You delivered my favorite line in the whole movie. Which one was that? The, the, the silver ones are the worst. Yes, yes. <laughs> they, are. they are. Worst. I think Justin can attest to that. He got his eyeballs sucked. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if that line was in a full movie theater, that would get like applause and cheering. Yeah. Like, it's like, yes, this movie's going to get even worse. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> so some of the things I kind of wanted to clear up here is uh, some behind the scenes details about the movie, kind of like get a timeline, because I think what you guys have done is just a very impressive and heroic feat to make this classic film in, uh, in what was basically around five months from shooting to a uh, finished film um, to be out in time for uh, the Rick and Morty uh, season finale. And uh, first off, I, I know that there were some actors that were cast that got COVID and couldn't make the movie and that, you, and that some people were replaced like days before filming started. Were, were any of you guys, the, the, la the people that came in, you know, days before shooting? No. <laughs> yeah, no? Not to my knowledge, no. No, it oh. was, <laughs> it was uh, Beth. It was uh, Hannah, the actress that plays Beth. Mm -hmm. There was a different actress for her. She got COVID and she's actually an, a, an amazing filmmaker that Casper knows. And so he called her up last minute and was like, hey, you want to get your head smashed? And, <laughs> and uh, yeah. she said yes. So it was actually uh, Beth. Um, she was really good. Well, did you guys have uh, a period of time to rehearse before you guys started shooting? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a blank statement. No, we didn't. Yeah, no, we didn't. We did that on set, especially all those, because I'm in all that, like, basically one shot uh, for the bulk of my time on it. But yeah, we basically showed up and they were like, mm, you guys are doing it like a play. And we were all like, great. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That is much of like a script was there to rehearse even. Well, for there me, was a full script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and for me, most of my stuff was already in my audition. So there, that was thankful. You know what I mean? Thankfully, there was a lot of, you had more time with the script. So, so wow. So all that, the blocking of like the horror moments, the throwing, wow, all that, on the day. That's impressive. That's super impressive because the blocking is so important in the movie because it helps mm -hmm. kind of pull your eye certain ways. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as um, Sky's character, Henry, enters the film, he immediately moves the 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 pale that's reflective and ups the tension because we don't know um you know we don't have any insight now into when the the the, the axe might drop and and then and then the movie really pays off on repeat viewings yeah in sort of catching little things that you might have missed that other characters did in the background um that is super super cool so so every time you guys did a setup and did a scene you guys did a full, figured out the blocking Wow! on the same day. Well, it was actually kind of um, cool because the day before shooting, Justin calls, he called me up and I'm, I'm get, assuming the other actors like late at night and he was like, listen, and mind you, I don't, I've never spoke to him before. And he's like, listen, um, this, they're shooting it at one take. I think we need to rehearse before. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And so we met up the morning before we started filming and we were just kind of saying our lines and getting into the groove. And then it was kind of like entropic decay on set where it's like we started out, you know, fine tuned and then we started improving and improving and improving. And yeah. you kind of see that in the, um, I think he, Casper chose a take where we were like more loose and we were just kind of adding things to the scene. Um, so I also enjoy watching that when I watch the movie. I'm like, oh, we're all doing little things. That's what I was curious about. So because of that sort of very loose structure, like how that we got to do more improv and stuff for, that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, is there any, did you guys have any like input or any, any tweaks on your characters or lines that like changed from when you were auditioning to like the the finished um, product? 
Yeah, I feel, um, I feel like for, there was a lot for me, and I know that there were, I think there were, was a lot for everybody. Um, it seemed to be a very collaborative shooting for everyone. And I was on set more than I was shooting just because of schedule. So I, I was like watching a lot of the scenes um, that I was supposed to do that, be in that day, but then because of scheduling, ended up hanging out, just seeing other people shoot their scenes. And there was a lot of improv, I know for my scenes, but um, for other people too, the, and additional lines that were added and whole chunks that were cut. Um, I can't speak to other people like who added a line that then made that scene, but I know I did. And definitely kind of was a point of that scene, seemed to be anyway. Awesome. And I was also wondering like how much of yourselves you kind of bring to to these roles. I'm specifically thinking of Sky here, but it's but everybody, because I mean Sky, you're a very convincing stoner. I've seen quite a few in my day. I'm sort of a connoisseur of of movie stoners. So you were really uh, I've I've, uh, I've done a lot of research. <laughs> but yeah, everybody, like how much of of yourself is in is in what you do? A good question. That's that's kind of being an actor, right? It's just you know, finding finding the best way to bring yourself to roles. I mean, I'm sure everybody has uh, everybody here can speak to that. Did uh, did any of you guys have to come back and do any ADR or like change anything yeah. in post production? I did. I don't know about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I okay. did. Um, they have ADR with. Um, with Diane who plays um, the, I have to give a shout out to her cause she's not gonna give it enough credit. She was the cleaning lady in the beginning. And she was so good. Mm -hmm. She was such a reactive, perfect, responsive actor. And she physically, fruit, she was physically wrestling with Brendan, the guy who plays Featherface, physically slapping her body against his. So I just have a shout out to her because she did a great job, but I saw her in ADR. We, we, maybe other people were there that day, but I had to go back and do uh, some ADR um, maybe in October, at which point I could see how much they'd done. And I was super impressed. They'd, yeah, they've been editing for like six weeks solid, 20 hour days. And it was so, so impressive. It was great to see. Did you see effects in October? Yeah, they weren't complete, but they were pretty much, I mean, I, that's what I was impressed with. I was like, wait, you did all that from, you know, July? They had like six editors working on it, doing all those effects. And so it wasn't complete, but I definitely got a, the bulk of what they were aiming for. And they, they polished it up from there. Yeah. So if, if the audition process was like basically your rehearsal time, how much, how long was, was each of yours audition process before, before you got offered the film? Uh, repeat the question. How, how long were you auditioning before you were, you knew you were going to start the movie? Oh, like how, how much time had passed? I think it was just, uh, oh God. It was like weeks, a month? No, no, no. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was it, they moved pretty quick. It was about maybe, maybe two weeks, maybe two weeks. Yeah, um, and we didn't really get the script until <laughs> a, a few days before, um, which was interesting as well, and and uh, made it a little a little difficult. Um, but yeah, it was yeah I, about two weeks I think yeah. So so was the oneer early in the production or or later in the production? The first three days were the oneers. Um, wow. The first day was me and Andrea. Second day was the sheriff and uh, the deputy, and then the third day was this whole crew. Wow. Yeah. And and it was I I think sixteen days is what I heard. Is this the entire the entire shoot? Is that correct? That sounds right. Yeah, it, it was short, um, shorter than too many cooks, which was Casper's you know other thing that he's known for. Wow. Uh, which is crazy to me because that's yeah. a ten minute long movie. Mm. based on like the based on the you know experience you guys have on other productions is this like the most like 
insane crazy production that you've ever worked on like as far as like how much is in the movie how little time there is to make the movie and then the budgetary constraints i would say yes i think in terms of like the thing too is that casper in my opinion did a very good job of not being super on edge while we were filming like casper has a very kind of like quiet humble um sort of aspect to him so we were just shooting the way it would work is that we would shoot the take all different types of ways we would shoot it straight then we would improv like we kind of shot the movie as a horror and then as a comedy so we kind of you know ran the gamut of takes and then um but 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 my point is casper never was like guys we have to do this we have to do this he, if anything, was the opposite. He was like, yeah, let's try that this way. And for that mentality on set, I'm so surprised that the movie actually got done and got done like a movie and got done well. I'm going to be honest. I was, when I first watched the film, I was like, this could go many different ways. I'm ready. But um, I'm really impressed with how much work was put into this film and uh, the conciseness of, you know, of the time constraints. Just, it's an impressive thing to me. Yeah, I second that. The time was amazing. I have to say that I think that that, that kind of that constraint and all that definitely reflects in the film. And one of the reasons I was so impressed with it, because I really, at no point did I truly know what was going to happen next. And like being someone who's watched hundreds and hundreds of horror movies, I'm thinking, okay, this scene with, you know, Sky in the fireplace is going to go this way, and then it goes a completely different way. And so I think that that it's amazing, like you said, that he was so chill. And I think that, and it helped even with, with all this. I think it really helped sort of shape the movie when you're watching it. You mm -hmm. feel that sense of like, who knows what'll happen in the next scene, in the next scene, and then. But every time it happens, you're just like, I was just so impressed by like, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I were like, this is the to me, this is like the everything everywhere all at once of horror movies. Like it's just <laughs> it goes in like every direction of mash. And to do that like with such a short, you know, time period to to pack it all into a 90 minute movie and do it really like handle everything really well is just like amazing to me. It's why it's, you know, all of our, you know, top top horror movies of the year. Wow. Cool. Um, I, I like really, um, minutia questions, if you haven't noticed, um, what was like craft services? What was the food like <laughs> on set? Did you guys have like a favorite thing to snack on? Like what got you through the movie? <laughs> uh, they did a good job. job. I love nature fig bars and I ate a lot of those because they're my favorite. <laughs> I drink Just a lot of coffee, a, a lot of iced coffee, and I'm grateful for that because not every set has iced coffee I've found, and I'm like a junkie for it. Um, so they were, they were very, very accommodating. With it. Thank you. Yes. Um, and also, honestly, I showed up late a couple of times and had dietary restrictions, and they were freaking amazing. So uh, shout out to Craft Service for being like above and beyond. Yeah, What's so surprising about iced coffee. Like you would think, I would think you want yes. to have every every kind of caffeine imaginable for yes. a movie set. <laughs> no, yeah, I, you'd be shocked the beverage situation, and I'm a beverage person, so there you go. <laughs> I feel like with crafty, I like I there's a similar pattern for every time on, I'm on set where I go in and I'm like, I'm going to be really good about this. Like, <laughs> I know what I'm doing in here. And then like cut to day three and I'm like, I need this. This I need. And like, and it's like, okay, what have you eaten? I've eaten a lot of Oreos. I've eaten a lot of Cheetos. You know, that, that becomes the makeup of my, the constitution of my diet over the and they had some really good cheetos man they had these like jalapeno cheetos Ooh, yummy yeah i'm about it tori yes ma'am what you, <laughs> obsessed with food on set or is that not i i think i was fasting i think i just decided look i gotta go heavy later on in this shoot so i'm just gonna fast 
something like oh, that. Yeah, yeah, but they, they did good. They did good. Uh, the the meals were really good. They did a vegan option and then another two, another two options of whatever it was every time. It was good. They were good good food. And the house that we were uh, shooting in, which was two houses away from the, you know, the green room house where we were hanging out, it seemed to like they there were big fridges and fr freezers so we could sort of bring our own stuff um but the food situation was good and then they had a lot of dried stuff which i like fruit rolls and stuff like that so i thought it was um above and beyond the Is food pimento cheese I know, right? She lived on pimento cheese. Is what she's saying. Yeah. What did that taste? What Scraped was that? Scraped off of Justin's mouth only. I'm a, <laughs> yes, for your mouth only. Was there like, actually pimento cheese? Yeah. No, I've never, I've never eaten pimento cheese. What was it? It was. Um, oh, you just you tell him. Yeah, it was. Uh, wasn't it uh, cottage cheese with peppers in there? With oh. peppers, but I, it was frozen, and the frozen worked better because it was so hot that it turned to soup really quick. So oh, it was like, so <laughs> the frozen. So it's frozen. basically frozen. I don't know if that's better or worse. Frozen <laughs> cottage cheese. It sounds oh. horrible. <laughs> we either drip off the knife, but they asked me, like, do you have any dietary restrictions? I was like, look, I don't even know what pimento cheese is. <laughs> Just as like, I'm from the South. I, I like it. So I'm like, oh, it, to me, it looks awful, I, but I've I don't know what it is. It just looks, it doesn't look like cheese. And in the audition, I was like, do you want a slice? And, but I don't, you can't have a slice of pimento cheese. So they, <laughs> Shane said, do you want it to be, so I don't know what this, I don't know what all you do. I, it's, he said, do you want it to be chickpeas or egg whites or oatmeal? We can make this cheese out of anything. <laughs> So it was going to be oatmeal, it was going to be chickpeas, and it wasn't in the end, just cottage cheese. It so I still had, yeah, I still haven't had pimento cheese. I feel like you might be averse now to trying that. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to feel like it's a pride thing. I'm just going to have to keep my position. It's, I, yeah. So I that's what it was. I love the Twitter comments with like, there's one Twitter comment. <laughs> They're like, this is the weirdest pimento cheese ad I've ever seen. That was the funny one. That was the funny one. But I didn't realize it was a tie into the cheese goblin. Right. Mm. Yeah, from Mandy. Yeah. And then they, yeah, they could legally not have the same brand, but he wanted it to be almost. Almost. Yeah. Yeah, it's a divine subsidiary. It's not the exact same, but it's it's in its spirit. It is. Justin, you gotta be on the lookout for different cheese gags in Casper Kelly movies now. Yeah, probably. It's gonna be like Tarantino's feet. Yeah, the Kelly verse. <laughs> Justin, did you go method and only eat food that people are get engaged to? That would say it again. Did you only eat food that people get engaged to, like charcuterie boards and uh, <laughs> and foie gras? <laughs> Uh, no, but I no, but I tell you what, I haven't touched pimento cheese since we did this movie. Yeah, I, 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 I imagine. I understand. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, You're ruined. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of. I've been on it for a while. Just sitting in my fridge, and I'll open that door and I'll look at it, and I'll just be like, mm, not today. <laughs> Someday, not today. I I really love all the all the subtle um, performances you guys were able to put in in such. A short amount of time. There's this. There's this moment of the movie that uh, is so adorable. It totally caught me off guard. Where Sky starts strumming uh, Holly's leg like a yes. guitar, um, as 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 you guys are saying this, you know, the, the some alien exposition. So like your your eye is drawn to to Sean develop delivering this exposition, but you're having like this this character moment here um, with your girlfriend that's just like adorable. Um, is there is there anything, any like moment in the movie that you guys put in there that feels like, you know, personal or, you know, hmm. extra special? Hmm. I think there are a lot of those because, you know, honestly, like I said, there was a lot of takes where it was improv and there was a lot of 
like figuring it out for ourselves, which was a, I thought it was great. Like before we, we were shooting, I asked Sky, I was like, well, you know, we, like, I feel like we should um, be sort of intimate in this scene. Like, can I touch you? And he was like, yeah, touch me. And so like, you know, me braiding, his, it sounds nothing like that. But I was like me braiding his hair and all that stuff. Like I look back on that and I'm really, it's really cool because we're, we're, we're all adding like little touches to things um, that was, you know, we're not in the script that I think are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. and I, I thought you, you braiding his hair was like especially interesting thing to add because there is sort of the, the question of like the, fetish, the fetishization of Asian men that's yeah. that's like one of the, the the ideas and themes in the movie and I think that you helped lend a little bit um to that theme by you know doing that little that touchy-feely the luscious moment. locks the luscious silken locks Holly yeah. can't uh stop yeah. <laughs> you know one stop. thing I, I really love about that you know working on that scene is that everybody was doing little improvised things like that but nobody was taking focus away from Justin and Andrew too much. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get that many takes. So it was like this really collaborative sort of synergy that was happening in the room, uh, which was cool as an actor, you know, because you always have that one person usually that is doing a little too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really wasn't happening yeah, with each take. I yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. Like as a watcher, like I never felt like anybody took focus away like you all worked so well and like the more elements are added like as in you can't the characters coming in and adding more and more it never felt like oh this is too much it just it just felt like this is this is a perfect like escalation of everything that's happening and in a, and in a movie where it's so important to draw people's eye in certain directions hey andrea hi guys and now joining us um, Andrea Lang, your favorite Andrea on Instagram. Um, she is in The Game, available on Paramount+. Plus. She plays Zoe in Adult Swim Yule Log. Um, she's also in Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul, the Sundance film, available on Peacock right now. Um, Andrea Lang has joined us. How are you doing, Andrea? I'm great. How's everyone doing? Good. Yeah. We're doing good. We've, I, I, we've just spent the last um, 20 or so minutes um, heroicizing this amazing film that you get to be uh, the lead and the final girl in um, and get to join uh, the hosts of great final girls in uh, horror film history. Um, how does it feel being uh, among, among the great final girls? It's it's cool. It's, <laughs> I don't know. It's been like this film in general is just like so wild that like I hardly ever think about it in that perspective. But yeah, it's great. And I think it's even more cool um, what he pointed out several times when we were filming as a woman of color at that too. So you rarely see that happening. So um, yeah, I'm really appreciative for the uh, representation and sorry. It's, um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, let me catch you up on some questions that, that we threw out before. What was your favorite food from craft services on set? <laughs> uh, um, the Tito's got a shout out, the, the Nutrigrain bars and the iced coffee. I, damn it, I hate being late. Um, could have stolen something from somebody else. Uh, I would have to say I discovered on this particular set they had uh, little packets of, uh, I think it was like vitamin D or something. They were like they were like little they were like little energy packets, and I took a couple of those, and those have been really um, really fun. They'll keep you up for a very long time. <laughs> you know, the, the, the things that you put in the, the fizzy things that you put in the water bottle. Yeah, you this is yeah. pop or something. I yeah. forgot, but I discovered those on this set too. I forgot about those. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I took. That, that was my favorite thing. And I have a, I have a few still actually. And they, um, they're just really good for like, if you need energy, I know it's not a food. Sorry. It's not an exciting answer, oh, but that's, that's a great answer. Yeah. 
I actually wanted to, uh, yeah, because you guys are talking about the craft services question. So it makes me so curious about the, you know, Atlanta, the Georgia film scene, which is so, has become so bountiful and amazing. And I wanted to, to know like, yeah, like what is it, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to like learn more about it. Like, it seems like it's a really cool supportive place, especially as you're talking about like, it's something as simple as craft services has options you haven't seen in other sets before. It just feels like maybe like, I don't know, does that like reflect overall of the entire scene and the people working in it? Guys? <laughs> I don't think I understand the question. What do you think about the Georgia film community and yeah. the Georgia film scene? Oh, right. Oh. I love working in Atlanta. I love working in Georgia. It's I'm from New York. Um, and every experience I've had has been a lovely one. I genuinely love everyone I worked with on this set. I think every one of you guys are just incredibly talented, cool people. Like I can't tell you enough about how I walked away from this experience and was like, wow, that was just, I, I feel they're thoroughly satisfied. Um, and I, I just, I do feel like that is different than working in New York or LA. There's just a warmth, there's a heart. In my experience, it's very, it's I very guess, I, yeah. I kind of feel the same. Oh, sorry, Sky, I cut you off. No, no, I, I was just at odds. It's just very communal. You know, Atlanta for a long time was very underestimated. All the artists here are underestimated. So we all support each other because, you know, when one person succeeds, everyone succeeds here. Mm -hmm. And that's um, how much of a uh, horror fans. Uh, were each of you before coming on to this film? I'm a pretty big horror fan. Yeah. Yeah, pretty big. Just like Justin, we we did an interview before, and we were both kind of like children raised by uh, appropriate films at a young age. Uh. <laughs> yeah, like way too young. Like I saw my first horror movie. I, it's, I, I did this interview, like Andrew said, with her, and I had, I think I saw my first horror movie at like five or six and uh, got like really hooked. And I would have nightmares every night. And I would oh, tell my mom, and, like night terrors. And she'd be like, well then stop, you know, like stop <laughs> watching these things. And I'm just like, no, I, but I can't do it. And, uh, and I actually haven't had a nightmare in, oh man, I think I ran out of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> About 15 years or something. Well, you know what you gotta do now, Justin, but like kind of like what he said, I was watching like, I was reading like the Goosebump books and like oh, yeah. watching um, Tales from the Crypt with the like the creepy like skeleton that rises out of the coffin. Mm -hmm. I was watching like Basket Case. You guys remember Basket Case? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Disturbing. Like, what even is that mutant? And um, <laughs> yeah, it's like watching. Are we allowed to cuss? Have you guys been cussing? You can but, cuss like a yeah, yeah, yeah. break it. Well, I can't cuss now that I like asked about it. It's not <laughs> But um, yeah, just watching a lot of fucked up stuff as a kid and it kind of just like permeated. So I think that's why I'm more gravitated to, I gravitate more towards like weird people or terrible relationships or interesting movies, you know? <laughs> well, when I was five and I lived in Trinidad, my parents took me to um, Gremlins. So that's <laughs> the first movies. And they that was supposed to be a movie for kids. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> I debate, but like, yeah, so I've had my nightmares early on, like being in the theater with all the gremlins watching Snow White, like that was one of my first dreams as a really young child that I remember. So yeah. definitely I understand that watching movies that probably not for five-year-olds, but getting yeah. super hooked on them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, I love the horror genre. I've watched a lot of horror. Like I like Jacob's Ladder and all that stuff. But for me specifically, I'm more of like a horror gamer. Like I love Resident oh. Evil. I love Silent Hill. Like, and I love Twin Peaks. It's not necessarily horror, but like when I read the script, I was like, oh my God, this is so David Lynchian. Like I'm yeah. fucked. Oh, well now I'm cursing. Can we curse? <laughs> yeah. Let it out. But I was like, I'm fucking about this. You can't say fuck and then stop. <laughs> I'm thinking about this. <laughs> uh, you know, my first horror film was The Shining. Um, I was six years old. My parents showed it to me as a prank. Um, but then I slept in their bed for like five years after that. So joke. <laughs> wow. They lost. They lost. <laughs> Sean? 
I, I think I'm a moderate horror film. I think I've seen a lot, but not like I'm not deep into the the genre. I I'm not. I, I was very affected by anything scary as a child, and probably still am. But um, yeah, no, no, I'm not like a huge horror film crazy geek. I wish I was, but no, I'm not. You can be. You're still young. I know, still you can be, Sean. This is in your control. Start watching. <laughs> Stop. Stop. No. <laughs> you guys have laying before you. In 20 years, you guys can tour horror conventions with this film. This is going to have a, a life beyond its existence. Oh, it's it's going to be huge. It's going to be a cult classic. It is no. a cult classic. I literally said that. I said that after I I read the script and we were making it. I was like, this is for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was not to cut you off, but like the first thing that came to mind was the room, and I thought about how like how weird that. I mean, don't be offensive, Andrea. Um, <laughs> the room. Yeah, no, I thought about how the script, uh, this this movie is definitely going to be a cult classic for sure. It's way too bizarro and like well made and beautiful and wonderfully acted. Uh, yeah. yeah, back to Torty. Sorry. Okay. No, I just I was like room or the room. No, wait. I think she meant the room. The, I said the room, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, hit her. yeah no, you. I think I have to remind myself which was which. Um, the, room the, room with the, the room was the really weird one by Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, then room was also that's kind of like a psychological horror almost. So sure. that's why I asked it, I guess, because they kind of have elements. I like the psychological horror stuff. Um, Sean, you mentioned um, The Shining. That's my go-to. I like. I love films like that. And then also whatever happened to Baby Jane, which I didn't even realize is horror, but it's it's that's a horror movie. That's definitely my go-to. Where, where it sort of borders on, that's a real person, but they've gone, they gone to the far field of weirdness. You know, they don't, they're not coming back. Dystopian weirdness, which is horror a lot of the time. So it's, I, I would say it's not my go-to genre, but those kinds of films are. Even Blair, stuff like Blair Witch that has some sort of supernatural element. Is that, that's horror? I don't know, the yeah. genre seems to, So there you go. I mean, because that's real people and I always gravitate toward real, real people stories. Always. So found footage? You're a fan of found footage movies a lot? Yeah, I'm a real fan of, rea like anything that's so real, you don't know if, is this real or not? Like the whole, like I grew up watching kitchen sink dramas, which were supposed designed to be like, here, you know, here's a camera in at the edge of the kitchen, literally like that. There's some guy holding a camera in the kitchen and he's watching people want to kill each other over a kitchen sink and somebody dies because they, they're stabbed. That kind of stuff. When you don't know if it's fly on the wall or if it's a real story or if it's a found footage, it's, so that very uncomfortable feeling of, oh my gosh, is this some somebody's home mid movie or is, is it like a film? Like that's my go-to because it's just so thrilling. There's so much adrenaline when that's horror. Mm -hmm. I just, I never heard it called found footage until <laughs> recently, but it is. That's so, I didn't realize that's a whole thing. I'm very innocent in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a subgenre, and, and we do a, uh, Every Halloween, we put together a different theme for each day in October, and we oh. try to give it a, a unique theme based on like horror sub genres. And the great thing about Adult Swim Eulog is that it can fit into so many sub genres and categories of horror because it it goes you know everywhere. Um, is there any any what well, I I know as I was watching the most horrifying part to me was because I'm a picky eater was the pimento cheese mm -hmm. but but thinking about the movie afterwards I think the most horrifying idea to me is is getting taken out of existence and having like the entire sum of your life um like erased and like all the actions and interactions that you had in your life that might have had some merit you know get erased because of like you know 
a bad moment. Um, are there any like horrors or, or things in the film that that that, that freak you guys out? Oh my god! Sorry if I, this is like too much of a uh, psychological uh, psychologist question here. <laughs> I guess what part of the movie freaked you out the most watching it? Like, do you feel was the most? I think the scene that actually really disturbs me, I think all of this, like, I, you know, I think growing up, a lot of us have fear of like getting killed while we're in the shower and, you know, like getting killed. <laughs> you and we're close not your looking. eyes yeah, and it's gone. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think the scene that freaked me out the most was when the man in the fireplace is eating the the bucket of crows where it's like the it's instead of kfc it's crows i found that so disturbing and that whole when we see him again with zoe how she goes in there and it's just this sort of surreal it almost looks like the shining because you have the the bartender there i think that moment is so strange because it's uncanny. It's like the real world, but it's one degree off. And to me, that's, that's mm. what is disturbing the most. Like, it's like, you know, when you have a dream that you're like, oh my God, this could be real. And then something happens that's a little bit extraordinary. I find that that was kind of disturbing to me. Yeah, the also, couple like- the fact that it's like the, the dream, it's like a dream, like physical life too, where it's like, yeah. we've all had those dreams where you're trying to punch someone or do something and you can't. And Andrea was like brilliant in that moment Killed of it. trying so hard to stab him. And it's like in slow mo. And then uh, when he takes that, it was, that was so real for me. I that love I was that. like, I love ooh, this world is weird in the fireplace. And the fact that she says, like, I want to live, you know, it's like such a crucial, it, it's like, yes, it's kind of like the falling action of the movie, but like, in some ways, it is kind of like Zoe's climax, where she yeah. gets, she chooses, she wants to live, and like, yet she's in this, this position that's so sort of ostensibly powerless. Yeah, because in the early in the movie, she spent a lot of time being so indecisive and, and unsure of like what next step she wants to take. So it, that's like a really important commitment for for Andrea's character to just be like that. No, yes, this is and, what I want. And Holly's character helps like reinforce that that theme in that when she's Holly's faced with death, she's ready to like no kill kill her. She's <laughs> prettier than me. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, Zoe's locked up, you know, and that's that's another another element of like horror, you know what I mean? Is how quickly does someone like turn on you to to save themselves? Justin, yeah. I think you had something scary to say. Oh no, I was piggybacking on the 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 scene in the in the bar when that family is just like suspended in time and their faces are like it's just that was my like, favorite like, part. Having a beach vacation and they just like teleported like to this liminal space between like the real world and hell or like whatever. You know what I mean? Is yeah, that was that's it's yeah, that was that and was, it's like never explained what nope. the fuck that was. I have, I, I have a head <laughs> that was the same spots, right? They you just see the three of them kind of like, like so happy but covered in blood. That was that that moment the film opened for me for real. I, I have a headcanon for that because I noticed that when Zoe gets pulled into the fireplace, um, that the last thing she says is she calls Holly Willow and it sort of has like that, that I think that it's like your trauma is what triggers the fireplace to kind of mess with you psychologically. And so when I was looking for what bothered Sky psychologically, Sky asks, he says that he got burned by rental cards before. So I think that maybe uh, Henry's character had some sort of traumatic event that happened to him on a family vacation. And then that was like sort of the key that that, that the fireplace could pull him in because that trauma was triggered you know that. past to count the it. rental cards. Yeah, I love reading fan theories. What y'all talking about? <laughs> Fill in the gaps. That was awesome. <laughs> I have a question for you guys, uh, Sky and Daniela. The the part where he, Henry says, "Oh, I'm not a good photographer," and then uh, Dan, Danny, you say, "No, you are." You kind of whisper to him, "No, you are." Did you improv that little interaction? It's actually in the script, but we did, what we did do though was we did it a lot of different ways. Where like Holly 
is kind of bitchier towards Henry and then she's kind of like more loving towards him like we did it a lot of different ways he's just sort of a non-photographer but he's like I'm a photographer my for my sister's wedding and it, yeah and he got this self-doubt self-doubt and I just love that moment where you just it was just like an aside no but you are a photographer that was a very real moment but it was just so sad <laughs> I think I I then Holly is the reason why why Henry dies. She's traumatizing him right there. She's, my she's my favorite thing about the Henry death is that like it, you know he's so insignificant that not much changes at all from him getting erased. <laughs> it's it's just another Asian guy. Like like none of the plot changes. None of it's just that's how insignificant. <laughs> I don't know because yeah. the, the other because then the, my other Asian boyfriend is so different than you. So I would have to beg yeah. to differ. But he's Asian. Yeah, but he's would, Asian. He, would, would Holly have still sold out Zoe if oh, if yeah. she was in a timeline with with Henry? That's that's, I, that's the I think that the way that we were filming it, there were again, since we did scenes where like I'm telling you, Justin and, and Andrea had some really funny like improv and um it felt to me like in the whole duration of our, our of our takes that these guys were, did not care about Holly at least that's how Holly thought of it you know because every every one of her crew just got fucking obliterated and I think in her mind she's like these people are not going to help me I have to get out of here I think Holly's instinct to survive is like immediately activated as soon as every one of her friends gets wiped out because you know she is a podcaster she does look up really grisly shit all the time so I think in her mind she's like I must get out of here like these people are not going to help me so I think that's another reason why she sells Zoe out because she thinks she probably thinks that Zoe's gonna you know Zoe's like Alex who doesn't care about Holly in Holly's mind I think that also explains why Holly runs away at the end of the movie <laughs> Yeah, she's like, fuck this. Like, I know how this goes down. <laughs> um, Andrea, I wanted to ask you, because we asked earlier um, a question about like how much input you were about to have with Casper about your character and your story. And like, do you feel like you you got to like, because it's the, um, everyone else said the set was kind of improvisational and, you know, and so just talk to your experience on that. Yeah, uh, Casper's just so easy to work with, which makes for, you know, coming to set, like, so enjoyable in the cast was, they're just, like, amazing people to gel with, and they're all so talented. He was always open to anything we wanted to bring or say. Um, there, were a, there, there was a lot that Justin also suggested, and then Justin and I as a team, and, um, like, even the part about Beyonce, like, Justin came up with that. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Let's see if, let, let's see if we'll use it. And he used <laughs> the final take, which I was like, oh, that's so delicious. Um, and I hope Beyonce, well, I hope you watch it, Beyonce. <laughs> but, um, he ended up, we, like, like Dee said, there was, we had a lot of, like, comedic moments that Casper did not end up using. And I realize now, seeing it, you know, final product, he used the most straight edge version of Zoe because he needed to so everything else can kind of um play better around her character because my natural inclination is to say some funny stuff or do some funny stuff but um I had to keep really grounded and serious while everything else was kind of going crazy around but the answer you yeah it was so easy to work with Casper and he's so lovely and mm -hmm. he's open to suggestion and he's We'll do like a take that's his. We'll do a take that's like crazy. And then at the end, he'll like, okay, fuck it mode. And so it's like, you never know what he's going to use. But um, yeah, he was very open and um, easy to work with. This is really making me hope that we get some outtakes at some point. Because the <gasps> oh, way you're describing the way that you shot this with all these like, improv and different takes, like, I want to see all of this. It sounds really. I want to see the whole copy yeah. of it, right? With like, BTN behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, really yeah. Well, we need a Blu-ray with a, with a commentary track <laughs> on the movie. We 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 need it all. We need something physical in our hands. Put um, it out there. Know, the the movie's available for purchase on Amazon Prime and on YouTube. And you know, I bought the movie like that, but but we're still at the, at the mercy of these giant corporations unless we get a physical copy in our hands. 
Um, do you guys have any inside info? Is that is that a possibility? Do we gotta start a changes.org position? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we can definitely inquire and uh, let you guys know for sure. Because we had some really, there was a lot of really funny stuff that happened behind the scenes. So we'll see. Yeah. If, if you guys don't do it, the Wundercast will probably create a bootleg version. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens to things that, that don't get released on physical media. You get all these, you get one guy at a comic convention who sells bootlegs of canceled TV shows. Oh, wow. People fondly remember. The Star Wars Christmas special, always. I love that. <laughs> so I have a question for Danny and Steven. Um, you watched the film, you loved it. This is the first annual U-Log special. So does that let you, does, is that any indicator that there's gonna be a second one? And if there is a second one, is there gonna be a trend with you know, as Holly ran off, what happened to Holly? Did Holly die? Is she going to come back? Like, is that something you guys would be interested in seeing? Yeah, and in, in, in my head canon, she's like the perfect main character for the sequel, you know? Yeah. She's mm -hmm. obviously shown that she's adept at avoiding horror tropes, okay? <laughs> and there's still, the cult is out there. There could be more aliens in the galaxy. The Yule Log gives an opportunity for every character that died to come back in some form. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, oh man, I want so many sequels. I felt like watching it, I was like, there should be more, there should be more, we can yeah. do more. Like, I, that's what I was so impressed about this this movie and Casper is like, he really world built mm -hmm. this idea of the hillbilly Bermuda Triangle just gives you so much opportunity to explore other stories in it. So. Yeah, and, and so often in horror movies, especially in the first movie, you don't get that much mythology sometimes. And here you have a rich mythology for several different horrifying things, including America itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think one of the scariest things in the movie are the moments where um, Alex, Justin's character, is sort of trying to like rationalize and sort of like do like the the type of like hustle thinking mm. that that will get us uh that that will you know that is supposed to be some sort of like comfort to zoe like oh we're gonna have a movie about this and we can monetize this some way in the future and you know this this catastrophe is really just success in disguise if we just play <laughs> this whole thing right like that is another layer of horror in the movie that i, I think is just masterful yeah, yeah. I, and that's I mean that one of the, I think my favorite thing about this movie is how many different thematic elements there are covered in really like succinct but really interesting ways and I was actually wondering like what are some of your favorite or like what like what things that resonated for you in terms of like the commentary and all the different like aspects of like what's going on i mean like the indigenous aspect and the you know the slavery aspect there's so many things going on i was interested in what um what spoke to you all the most i think that i think one thing that i noticed when i rewatched it was how you know because when you're on set you're thinking about what you're doing you're just listening you're just watching when I watched it as an audience member, I was like, wow, we're really not listening to Zoe at all. Like Zoe yeah. is, she has a very valid reason for being freaked out and everything could have been avoided if, you know, honestly, if Alex was like, okay, you're freaked out, let's go. Yes. You know? And if, if we were like, and then the, the fact that we're trying to show her a picture of a lynching and we're getting yeah. entertainment from that, like, I didn't realize how fucked up that was until I'm watching it. And then I have like a theory for why Holly survives, if I may. Um, I think that there is, you know, this idea when Alex is like, you know, if every star, if every, um, I forget the, what the line is specifically, but if every place there was a murdering of an indigenous or a black person, you know, there'd be haunted Starbucks. Like that is actually, fucking true like yes. if you think about we're we are on land that has so much you know trauma involved in it yeah. and it's kind of interesting because yes it's funny and it's absurdist that there's a log trying to kill us but that shit is real 
And so I think why Holly survived is that I think the, the log's trauma is against these sort of like interracial couples, specifically black and white, because that was something that she couldn't have. And I think Holly, I'm neither white or black, and Holly dates neither white or black guys. And if you think about it, like Guy's character, he was killed by the guy in the fireplace. He wasn't killed by the log. And then uh, T's character, he jumped on the log. The log didn't necessarily go for him. So I think that there is something very specific about what the log is trying to do. It's kind of this like, sort of like Jungian idea of mastery. Like Carl Jung says that we go back to things that traumatize us because we are trying to master them. That's why like sometimes we go into relationships that are toxic or whatever. And I feel as though like in a strange way, the log is trying to do that because she's, she's triggered by the relationship that Zoe has with Alex because it's kind of like this concept of time privilege, right? That's my the log, idea. The log is a female? You just said she, right? Yeah, the log is a female. <laughs> she's like she? our son. She's, she's the spirit of, she has the, the woman's uh, spirit in her. That's what I think. I think you could even build on that and be like, if 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 the flying log is is Rosa, maybe yeah. she's trying to save people by killing them so that they don't get erased from existence, you know? I, I don't know. I feel like it's sort of like everyone's trapped in that moment of trauma. They're repeating it over and over mm -hmm. and over again. I feel like that's what's happening. I feel like like they're stuck. And especially that like really you know sequence at the end where she's like running the company and he's like working for her like it's that moment of like it goes back to the idea of the log guy talking about time privilege like if they it, but like not not in the silly way that he was sort of talking about it like forgive me for my awful sins more just like if they had had a chance to live in a different time and she had had a chance to live in a different time she could have you know really like sort of like had that moment with her child and like loved him and, and it's but she's trapped she's trapped in this awful past that she can't escape and and that's a really affecting part of the movie for me hey, i had a question for andrea yes um that it's this is something that me and danny talk about a lot danny is half trini and half jamaican i noticed she, that when she, you mentioned that earlier yeah, she gets so annoyed that Jamaicans never play Jamaicans in movies, and it drives her crazy. <laughs> you guys seen, have you guys seen Nanny? No, no. Nanny, yes. you haven't seen yet on Prime. There's some Jamaican representation in there, and I was very proud of it. All day, it was very brief, and they were playing nannies. We'll fix that in the future, I hope. Um, remember, they can be a normal Jamaican person. Um, yeah, it's it's and I, and I apologize. I I am first generation. I don't sound like it. I don't even know if I look like it. But like, yeah, I I wish that it was more of a thing for sure. Like, listen to my parents. Like, straight up bobsled team. I sound nothing like my people at all. Um, but yeah, I wish that there were there were more Jamaicans being able to. My be I well, it's interesting because when I was young, when I first moved here from Trinidad, my accent was very strong. And I actually made a conscious, conscious, subconscious choice as a child. I felt subconscious not sounding like everybody else. Mm. And so fortunately, I think that even at six years old, I suppressed my own accent. Mm -hmm. And then I did theater. So, you know, obviously in theater, you learn to change your voice and get even more. And I can still go back to my accent, but it's just, it's very strange to me, like, you know, obviously I was very young and most people were very young and they live in another place for so long, they sort of lose a bit of their accent. But I remember distinctly like going like, I don't sound like other people. That's weird, right? And like, that's really sad because I never even talked to my parents about it. Like I just sort of picked it up subconsciously. That is so fascinating. You're blowing my mind a little bit, but I mean, it's true in the sense of like, British people were, are encouraged to keep their accent. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, there's a lot we can like pull that apart, but like some people we tell you have to drop your accent and some people we like bolster and pedestal, you know, put them on a pedestal. So it's really interesting. Never thought about that. Yeah. British people are encouraged to keep their accent if it's a posh British accent, but there's a lot of Jamaican people in Britain who are not encouraged. So if you speak like the queen, 
the past queen, then maybe you're encouraged to keep your accent. Just to just to confirm the British, because I've got little in, in insider information on that one. You know, only if you speak posh, maybe. That since we're on this this topic, Torty, did you 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 grew up in, in New Zealand? Or did you why um, did you well, I have two passports. I've just reapplied for my green card, so I don't know if I should say any of this. <laughs> you don't. What's going on? Let's move on. <laughs> no, they actually think they should be fine. They, they took my money. Crikey. I, I think it's good to show on this that you have, you know, a very America needs Torty here to make movies and <laughs> You can put this I link did. in your application. Yeah, they deeply no. want in America for her entertainment. I grew up in, no, I grew, I grew up in a few places, two places in between. Cool. Did yeah. you ever work in the New Zealand film community? New Zealand, no. No. There's a, a lot of people I'd love to work with there, though. What, and this is for everybody, what are, what is like your bucket list? Uh, director that you, you'd love to work with in your career? Manifest for 2023. Let's go. Taika. Taika Waititi. Nice. Yeah, I'd love to work with the Coens. Good choice. I, yeah. I, I can see your comedy style being Coen Brothers influenced. Yeah, totally. I would like to work with Adam McKay. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I think I would pick Mike White right now. Hmm. Nice. White Lotus full of rock. So. I've always wanted to work with David Lynch. I think you're pretty close working with Casper Kelly. So pretty yeah. good. <laughs> Sky? Oh, um, you know, my two favorite directors uh, as a teenager were Danny Boyle and Paul Thomas Anderson. So Daniel Day Lewis is retiring. So if you need a. Uh, yeah. Daniel Day <laughs> Can you give uh, us a little? Method. Can you give us a reading of "I Drink Your Milkshake"? <laughs> no. Uh -huh. no, no, I'm not going to do that to the wall. As as Henry though. As Henry. <laughs> oh, there's milkshakes. <laughs> Where's the milkshake? <laughs> Did you guys have a chance to? like hang out afterwards. I know you guys seem to have come together for a premiere at some point. Did you guys have any chance to bond as a, as a cast um, off camera or off set? A little bit. I, I saw Tori in the park the other day. I was just walking by. Um, she was yeah. on a bike. She looked like she was out of a fairy tale. She was <laughs> wearing this cool get up. We talked for like an hour. Yeah. Um, I, went, I just got back from New York a couple weeks ago and I got to hang out with Daniela while I was up there, which was nice. Yeah. Happy birthday, Daniela. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I hang out with a lot of you guys. As Like when I'm in Atlanta, I see, I see my friends. I consider everyone here my friend. And so you guys formed the relationship on the set? This is the first time you guys met or have you guys, I know. For me, some... yes. For me, I didn't know anyone. Yeah, I know Andrea and Justin have worked together a few times before and are from the same agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do New York actors tend to work more in the Atlanta scene than like LA actors? Do you find that or is it sort of, it doesn't matter that kind of bounce back and forth? I have no idea. I'm, I'm just kind of like, for a long time before COVID, I was just living out of my suitcase, just mm -hmm. in different Airbnbs. So I was repped in LA and New York. And then eventually when I was in LA, I added Atlanta because wherever you need me, I'll be. <laughs> like, I'm, I have no, I'm not a, I'm not one of those actors that gets inconvenienced by travel. So I, I can't really attest to that. I just know that personally, I, you know, people in Atlanta want me for a project. I'm there. <laughs> um, Sean and, and Torgy, um, both of you guys had some uh, practical effects made of your of your body. What was what was that process like for you? Is this your first time working with with effects in this way? Yeah, I've never done any sort of uh, like prosthetics and stuff. Um, 
my mine was done actually in like four different installments of like adding on to my face and then obviously I'm not the body at the bottom <laughs> with like the cord out uh head but uh they did have a couple of options but then they opted for just layering on uh more prosthetic on me and uh it was actually really 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 fabulous like I'd never have done anything like that and we figured it out in the moment they had like maybe two hours to build that whole wow. sequence, but we did it in like 25, 25 minutes. And wow. um, yeah, it was one take of every installment. And uh, I think that maybe since I'd never done it before, I was so willing to just throw myself around. Um, and yeah, uh, they just kept layering on. I have I have BTS of them being like, go again, just add more blood, you know, just put another round of blood in his mouth and add the next layer. And uh, by the time I was out of the shower, they had it edited. Wow. So, wow. Uh, Torty? Yes, ma'am. I, they, they uh, made a whole mold of my head, the front of my face. And that was not pleasant, but you know, just gotta do it. And they were like, look, if you don't wanna do it, it's okay. And, um, how did we do? I just sat in a chair and they, they were like, okay, get ready. They just made up the whole bu bucket of whatever it is, latex, quick drying latex. And once they start mixing, they're like, look, we got 30 seconds before this thing sets. So they just piled it all on. Um, and it was nasty. And it, 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 you know, you have to kind of just sit there with everything all freezing cold and uh, while it sets for about 20 minutes. 30 minutes and that was it. Um, and so they, I guess then they made a, a head out of that and then they made several different uh, like flexible puppets of my face out of that. And then there was like a bunch of these painted models of me in the, you know, on set, which it was kind of weird for me to look at, but yeah, they, they made a bunch uh, all in various states of dehydration were the were the tubes all digital or was it some practical you mean with the the, the antenna going in that was digital but i think it was different for justin it was both they, they 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 did it practically but they obviously they they did visual effects on it because they have just like uh, uh they 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 actually had practical suckers <laughs> it's just funny it's 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 funny to remember um, nice. I was playing with those suckers. Yeah, they had they had practical suckers that they like put on my eyes and in my mouth, and I was screaming or whatever. And I and actually when that scene was coming up, I was like, "Ooh, I wonder what this is gonna look like." And then I saw mm -hmm. it, and I was like, "Oh wow, that looks great!" Yeah, yeah, great. it looks great. Yeah. Uh, so, and Shane did a great job. He's a brilliant effects guy so with yeah. the models. He's so good. Yeah, shout out Shane Morton. He's great. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys so much for being on the podcast. Yes. I'm going to wrap this up and not take more of your precious and valuable time, <laughs> but I, I need to once again extend my my huge thanks for being in. Thank you so much, the, all of you. The best film ever. <laughs> this is a, a life-changing, inspiring film that I think is going to live on for a long, long time and make a lot of people happy. Like, like, I think this movie deserves to be with, like, Rebel Without a Crew and Clerks and uh, Mariachi and, and Reservoir Dogs in, like, films that inspire people to be filmmakers. Like, this is a an epic uh, first uh, feature film by Casper Kelly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if I could give you guys all, send you guys all an award, I, I physically <laughs> would do so. I think this is the best micro budget movie I've ever seen. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your fan worship. I mean, it's it's like glowing. It's fantastic. Guy? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, just on that note, before before y'all wrap up, we gotta shout out Media Team as yes. a production yeah. oh, company that did this because they, they did this for be less they less could... money. Imagine what they could do with more money, more time. They should be hired for anything. Never. Yeah, they did so good. 
they really did a good precisely, job. That's precisely why it ended up shooting to the top of my horror list for 2022 because I'm like, you know, to be to be to be real, like I was I I actually made a TikTok right after I saw the movie and it went like like mini viral of me being like the best horror movie just dropped like a Beyonce album like on <laughs> like on, on HBO Max and like I can't believe word of mouth is the only way people are really gonna see this and some people were like oh it's just gimmick filmmaking and all this stuff and I, I was like no like I made a defense video like you don't understand like it's more you have to focus on like the time constraints the talent here the, the skill that was put into this movie that was made from soup to nuts in under six months, like that is, that's unheard of. Like it's so impressive. And the amount of like ideas and stuff and, and ambition that went into making the movie, like that's what is just why it's one of the best horror movies of the year. Because if like, yeah, like I just, that's how I feel. So it, it's hard. So the day it was released, it was <laughs> impressive. You rock. Do you have a last question that I haven't touched on? Um, I would love to sort of wrap up. I know uh, Daniele uh, a little bit earlier um, offered up a head cannon. I wonder what if you any of the rest of you have any like crazy head cannons about this movie, and like what happens at the end. I don't know if you like are clued in on like what everything means, or if you have some like theories about what what's going on i would love to hear any any theories that you might have wow uh, okay <laughs> i don't know for a fact all i know is that you know that log showed up at the end when we were making it out just at by the hair of our chin cut to the wide shot could have been just an exploding can of grape jelly. You just, you know what I mean? Like, we don't know right. if I'm dead. We don't know. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, we don't know for a fact if we're actually dead. And that's we don't know. We don't know if anything happened because for me, the also one of the lines that this is hinged on is when uh, Alex says, maybe we should up your meds. And that's when I wanted Zoe to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alex was kind of a dick. For yeah, sure. kind of, but Andrew, your reaction, it just lasted like five minutes before you said anything. I was like, yes, you just went through the whole gamut of, did you not just tell me? Wow. Could you, you why? That was a horror line to me. Like that was a line from a horror movie to me. So maybe the whole thing just didn't happen. Yeah. Maybe it's all in your mind. So I like that's a that's a great that's a great closing note to go on. Is to question freaking everything. Everything. Yes. Amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sky. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Tordy. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We. I'm Steven. <laughs> That's the Danny. Day. <laughs> and Thank you. The house. And uh, remember, kids, Thank when you. getting your uh, skull bashed in by a Yule log in the shower, um, make sure to turn off the water because <laughs> the environment cannot stand for <laughs> water just running. And I don't know if anyone actually turned off that water. I don't know. That That's might be the biggest point. plot hole in the entire mm. film that invalidates everything I've said before. The cabin is flooded. <laughs> the, the log turned off. Hey, I wonder. Hey, I wonder. Wondercast? Give yeah. it up for Wondercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wundercast. What's up, everybody? This is Jason David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Wundercast. Oh, my God! find it at Vundacast, and I know they love Effie.
subscribe to the Vondacast.